Wisdom Develops Samadhi, 2. By Akariya Mahabhoa Sampano. Translated by Akariya Panyavato. 4. Samadhi 3. Samadhi is by name and nature calmness. It is of three kinds as follows. 1. Kanaka Samadhi, in which the heart becomes unwaveringly fixed and calm for a short time after which it withdraws. 2. Yopakara Samadhi, of which the Lord Buddha said, that it is almost the same, but it lasts longer than Kanaka Samadhi. Then the Siddha withdraws from this state. 3. Apana Samadhi, is Samadhi that is subtle, firm, and unwavering, and in which one can remain concentrated for a long time. One may also remain concentrated in this state, or withdraw from it as one wishes. Here, Yupakara Samadhi will be briefly discussed from the viewpoint of the forest Dhamma.8. In Yupakara Samadhi, when the Siddha has dropped into a calm state it does not remain in that state, but partially withdraws from it to follow and get to know about various things which have come into contact with the heart. Sometimes something arises concerning oneself and one sees a vision, Nimitta, which is sometimes good and sometimes bad, but in the first stage the Nimitta will generally be something about oneself. If one is not careful this can lead to trouble, because Nimittas which arise from this kind of Samadhi are of innumerable varieties. Sometimes in front of one there appears an image of oneself lying down dead, the body decayed and swollen, or it may be the dead body of someone else. Sometimes it is a skeleton, or bones scattered about, or maybe one sees it as a corpse being carried past. When such a nimitta appears, a clever person will take it as his agaha nimitta. In order that it may become the patibhaga nimitta, because this will steadily lead to samadhi becoming firm and to wisdom becoming penetrating and strong. For a person, who has a strong ability in maintaining a detached rational attitude, to be successful in gaining value from such a nimitta he will always tend to develop mindfulness and wisdom, sathipanna, when faced with it. But there are a lot of people whose natures are timid and easily frightened. And Yopakara Samadhi may do harm to the Siddha of a person of this type because this class of Samadhi is of many different kinds and many frightening experiences can occur. For example, the image of a man may appear, whose bodily shape, color, and social position are all frightening, and he may appear as though about to slash at one with a sword, or to eat one. If however, one has little fear and is not timid, one can suffer no harm in such circumstances and one will learn more and more methods of curing one siddha from these kinds of nimittas, or samadhi. But with a timid person who usually tends to look for fearful things the more he sees a frightening nimitta the larger it becomes, and at such a time he may unfortunately be driven mad. As for external nimittas which come and go, one may or may not know whether a nimitta is external or whether it arises from oneself. But when one has become skilled with internal nimittas which arise from oneself, one will be able to know which are external nimittas. External nimittas are associated with many different happenings of people, animals, pritas, buddhas, ghosts of the dead, the son of a deva, a devata, indra, or brahma, any of which may at that time be associated with one samadhi. Even as one talks to a guest who comes on a visit. When such incidents occur they may last for a long or short time depending on how long the necessary conditions last that are required for such happenings. Sometimes however, the first set of conditions dies away and another set of conditions arises continuing from the first set, which is not easily brought to a close for the theme may be of short or long duration. When it dies away and the Siddha withdraws, it may have spent several hours in this state. For however long the Siddha remains concentrated in this kind of Samadhi, when it withdraws one will find that it has not increased one's strength of Samadhi. Nor made it more firm and durable, nor will it have helped to develop and strengthen one's wisdom. It is like going to sleep and dreaming, when one wakes one's mind and body will not have gained their full strength. But when one withdraws from the type of Samadhi in which one became concentrated and remained in this one state, one will find that the strength of one's samadhi has increased and it has become more firm and durable. Like someone who sleeps soundly without dreaming, when he wakes his body and mind will feel strong. In Yupakara Samadhi, if one is still not skilled and does not use wisdom to be careful and watchful on all sides, 
it may cause much trouble and can drive one mad. Those people who practice meditation generally call this state broken dhamma, and it comes about because of this type of samadhi. But if it is done with due care it can be of value in connection with some things. As for the agaha nimitta which arises from the siddha, as was explained at the beginning of this chapter, this nimitta is the most suitable basis for the development of the patibhaga nimitta. Which accords with the principles of meditation of those who want a method which is both skillful and truly wise, because this is the nimitta that is associated with the Arya Saka, noble truths. One must absorb the impression of the Patibhaga nimitta into one's heart, then it may be considered to be the Arya Saka. Both nimittas which arise from oneself and those which come from external sources may lead to trouble if one is a timid person, and it is important to have wisdom and courage when things happen. But one who has wisdom is not one sidedly biased against Yupakara Samadhi. It is like a poisonous snake, which although dangerous, is sometimes kept by people who can benefit from it. The methods of practicing with both kinds of nimittas arising from this type of samadhi, yopakara samadhi, are thus as follows. A. The nimitta which arises from the siddha is called the internal nimitta, and one must go on and turn it into the patibhaga nimitta as has already been explained above. B. The nimitta which arises and is due to external entities such as a person or animal. If one is still not skilled at samadhi, one must stop and one must not, for the time being take any further interest in the matter. But when one has become skilled at samadhi, one may let the siddha go out and follow the nimitta and find out what is taking place. It will then be of great value to link together the events of the past and future. Samadhi of this kind is very strange, and one must not go to extremes and hastily become either enraptured by it, or sorry. But one must make the heart bold and fearless when the various kinds of nimittas arise from Yupakara Samadhi, and at the outset see them in terms of the Tilakhana, Anaksa, Dukkha, and Anatta, as soon as any appear. Then they will not cause any trouble. It should however be understood that the kind of Samadhi in which these nimittas appear does not occur in every case, and where it does not occur, for however long the Siddha remains in a concentrated state, hardly any nimittas appear. These are the type of people of whom one may say that, wisdom develops samadhi. With these types of people, even when the siddha has dropped down into a calm and concentrated state, nimittas do not arise however long they remain in this state, because wisdom is associated with and gets involved with the samadhi. But where samadhi develops wisdom, it is probable that a nimitta will appear in nearly every case, because this kind of siddha drops into a concentrated state very quickly. Like a person who falls into a well or pit, he does so because he is not careful and falls suddenly. Thus the siddha drops down all at once and reaches its resting place, then it retreats from there and comes to know various things, and at that moment a nimitta appears. This is the way it occurs in nearly all such people whose siddha is of this type. But whatever type of samadhi is developed, wisdom is always the thing that is important. When one has withdrawn from samadhi, one must contemplate the elements, Datu, and the Kandas with wisdom, because wisdom and Samadhi are a Dhamma pair which go together and cannot be separated. So if Samadhi does not progress sufficiently, one must use wisdom to assist it. This is the end of the section dealing with Yopakura Samadhi. It should be understood that Samadhi of all types is what aids and supports the development of wisdom, and the extent to which it does this depends on the strength of one's Samadhi. In other words, samadhi which is gross, middling, or subtle, aids and supports wisdom which is gross, middling, or subtle respectively, and it is up to a wise person to turn his samadhi to use by developing wisdom. But generally speaking, whatever type of samadhi is attained, one who practices meditation is likely to become attached to it. Because when the siddha drops into a concentrated state and while it rests there, a state of calm and happiness is present. It can be said that in being attached to samadhi, or calm, the siddha has no problems while it remains concentrated, and can remain at rest for as long as one wishes, depending on the level of one's samadhi. An important thing is that, when the siddha has withdrawn, it still longs for its state of repose although one has enough calm to meditate using wisdom. 
and one's calm is sufficient so that one should be able to use wisdom very effectively. But one still tries to stay in a state of calm, without being at all interested in the development of wisdom. This is becoming addicted to samadhi and being unable to withdraw from it in order to go further. 5. Wisdom The right and smooth way for one who practices meditation, once the siddha has become sufficiently calm to see the way, is to begin by training it to investigate the parts of the body with wisdom. Either singly or as many parts, opening up and looking into one's own body. One may start from hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, marrow, spleen, heart, liver, pleura, kidneys, lungs, small intestine, large intestine, fresh food, old food, digested food, etc. These all together, being called the 32 parts of the body. These parts are by normal standards always loathsome and detestable, and there is not one of them which is beautiful and charming as they are usually thought to be by people in the world. In life these parts are loathsome and unpleasant, and in death even more so, quite irrespective of whether they are the bodily parts of an animal or human beings, man or woman, for this is the nature of all of them. The world is full of things such as these loathsome parts and it is hard to find anything more strange. But whoever lives in this world must have such things, must be such things and must see such things. Anixa, impermanence is the nature of this body. Dukkha, hardship and pain is the nature of this body. Anatta, the negation of the desires of all beings is the nature of this body. Things which do not fulfill any of one's hopes are about and within this body. Delusion with regard to beings and Sankharas, is delusion with regard to this body. Attachment to beings and Sankharas is attachment to this body. Separation from beings and Sankharas is separation from this body. The infatuations of love and hate are infatuation with this body. Not wanting death is anxiety about this body and when dead, the weeping and mourning of relations and friends is because of this body. The distress and suffering from the day of one's birth to the time of one's death is because of this body. All day and night, animals and people run this way and that in swarms, searching for places to live and food, because of the nature of this body. The great cause and the great story in this world, which is the will that whirls people and animals around without ever letting them open their eyes properly to the nature of their state. And is like a fire burning them all the time, is the story of this body which is the cause of it all. Beings are inundated by the defilements, kills us, until they are quite unable to extricate themselves from this situation, because of this body. In brief, the whole story of this world is the story of what concerns this body alone. When one examines the body and what is related to it with wisdom, in the foregoing way without stopping, so that it becomes clear and evident to the heart. From where can the defilements raise their army to prevent the heart dropping into a state of calm? Wisdom is proclaiming the truth and making the heart listen, and when it is doing this all the time, where can the heart go to oppose the truth that comes from wisdom? From the heart come the defilements, and from the heart comes wisdom, so how could it be that the heart, which is oneself, should not be able to cure one's own defilements by means of wisdom? And when wisdom dwells upon the body in this way, why should one not see clearly within the body? When the heart views the body in the foregoing way, with wisdom, it will become wearied both of one's own body and the bodies of other people and animals. This will reduce one's pleasurable excitement in regard to the body, and will thus withdraw yupadana fixed attachment to the body, by means of samachetapahana, cutting off attachment by abandoning it. At the same time one will know the body and all its parts as they truly are, and one will no longer be deluded by love or hate for the body of anyone or anything. The Siddha in using the spyglass of wisdom to go sightseeing in the city of the body can see one's own body city and then that of other people and animals quite clearly. Until one comes to see in greater detail that all the roads, streets and alleyways are divided into three aspects, which are the ti lakhana, anaksa, dukkha and anatta and into four aspects, which are the four elements, Ditu, earth, water, fire, air, and this is so throughout every part of the whole body. 
even the lavatory and the kitchen are to be found within this body city. One who is able to see the body clearly in this way may be classed as a locavitu one who can see clearly within the city of the body throughout all the three world spheres, ti locavitu, by means of yathabhutananadasana which means seeing in a true way everything within the body and coming to the end of all doubts with regard to the body, and this is called Rupa Dhamma. We now go on to a discussion of Vipassana in connection with Nama Dhammas. Nama Dhammas include Vedana, Sana, Sankhara, and Vinana, these four being the second group of the five Khandas, but they are more subtle than the Rupa Kandha which is the body. One cannot look into them with one's eyes, but one can come to know them by way of the heart. Vedana, means those things, feelings, which are experienced by the heart that are sometimes pleasant, sometimes painful, and sometimes neutral. Sana, means remembering, recollecting. For example, remembering names, sounds, objects and things, or verses in the Pali language, etc. Sankhara, means thinking or thought constructing, imagination, such as thoughts which are good or evil or thoughts which are neither good nor evil. Or for example, thought constructing which is based on the past and imagining the future. Vinana, means awareness, sense awareness, of forms, sounds, smells, tastes, or things which touch us, and of mental objects. Just at that moment when these things come into contact with the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, or heart respectively. These four Namadamas are the activities of the heart, they come from the heart, they may be known in the heart. And if the heart is not careful they are also the deceivers, Maya, of the heart, and so they are also the things which can hide or obscure the truth. Investigation of these four Namadamas must be done with wisdom, and entirely in terms of the T.I. Lakhana. Because into whatever mode they change, these Kandas always have the T.I. Lakhana present within them. But when investigating these four kandas one may do so in any one of them. And in any one of the ti lakhana as one's heart truly prefers, or one may do so generally in all of them together if it prefers it that way. Because each of the kandas and the ti lakhana are aspects of the dhamma which are linked and related together. Thus if one investigates only one of the kandas or ti lakhana, it will lead one to understand, and to see deeply and fully into all the other kandas and ti lakhana. The same as if one investigated them all together at the same time, because all of them have the Arya Saka, the noble truths, as their boundary, their territory, and as that which accommodates them. This is like eating food, all of which goes down into one place, the stomach, and then permeates to all parts of the body, which is the total territory that accommodates it. Therefore one who practices must set up mindfulness and wisdom so as to get close and intimate with the Nama Dhamma which are these four Kandas. All the time these Kandas are changing, for they appear, remain for a time then die away and cease, and being impermanent they are also Dukkha and Anatta. This is how they display and proclaim their true nature, but they never have time to stop and look at it. They never have time to become calm, not even one moment. Internally, Externally, everywhere throughout every realm, Lokatatu, they proclaim with one voice that they are impermanent, and are thus Dukkha and Anatta. And that they reject the longings of beings and this means that none of these things have an owner. They proclaim that they are always independent and free, and that whoever deludedly becomes attached to them only meets with suffering. Depression and sorrow which fill his thoughts and heart until in the end his tears of misery are like an ever flooded river and it will continue to be thus throughout time while beings remain deluded and entangled. Yet it is easy to point out that the five kandas are the well of tears of those who are steeped in delusion. Investigating all the kandas and sabhavadamas, things in nature, with right wisdom so as to know them clearly is for the purpose of minimizing one's tears and for diminishing the process of becoming and birth. Or for cutting them away from the heart, which is the owner of dukkha, so that one may receive perfect happiness. Sabhavadhamas such as the Kandas are poisonous to one who is still sunk in delusion, but one who truly knows all the Kandas and Sabhavadhamas as they are, cannot be harmed by them and may still obtain value from them in appropriate ways. It is like a place where thorny bushes grow, 
they are dangerous to anyone who does not know where they are and who gets entangled in them. But someone who knows all about them can use them to make a fence or a boundary for a building site, thus obtaining value from them in appropriate ways. Therefore, one who practices must act skillfully in relation to the Kandas and Sabhavadamas. All these things, Kandas and Sabhavadamas, arise and die away based on the Siddha the whole time, and one must follow and know what is happening to them with an all-embracing wisdom that will immediately know what they are up to. One must take this up as an important task to be done in all four postures, without being careless or forgetful. The teaching of Dhamma, Dhammadasena, which comes from the Kandas and Sabhavadamas everywhere at this stage, will appear by way of unceasing mindfulness and wisdom, and this teaching will not be lacking in eloquence of expression. All the time it will proclaim the facts of the T.I. Lakhana within one by day and night, and while standing, walking, sitting or lying down. And this is also the time when one's wisdom should be ripe for listening, as though one were meditating on the Dhammadasanas of the wisest monks. At this level, the person who is doing the practice will be completely absorbed in his research into the true nature of the Kandas and Sabhavadamas which are proclaiming the truth of themselves and he will hardly be able to lie down and sleep because of the strength of the energy in the basis of his nature, which searches by means of wisdom into the Kandas and Sabhavadamas without resting or stopping. These, Kandas and Sabhavadamas, being the same as the basis of his nature. Then from the Kandas and Sabhavadamas he will obtain the truth, and it will be made clear to his heart by wisdom that all the Kandas and Sabhavadamas everywhere throughout. The three world spheres, T.I. Lokatatu, are of such a nature and normality that none of them seem to be defilements and craving, kilses and tanha, in any way whatsoever. Which is in contrast to the deluded understanding of most people. The following simile may help to explain this. Supposing some things are stolen by a thief, those things become tainted by association with the thief. But once the authorities have carefully investigated the case until they have sufficient witnesses and evidence, and are satisfied, the stolen goods which have been recovered can be returned to their original owner, or kept in a safe place so that no blame shall be attached to them. The authorities are then no longer concerned with the stolen goods, but only with the punishment of the thief. They must then obtain evidence against the thief and arrest him and bring him to trial in accordance with the law. When the truth of his guilt is established by reliable witnesses and evidence, the blame is put on the accused in accordance with the law. And any others who were not to blame would be allowed to go free, as they were before the incident. The behavior of the Siddha with ignorance, Avihya, and all the Sabhavadamas, are similar to this. For the Kandas and Sabhavadamas throughout all the three world spheres, T.I. Lokatatu, are not at fault and are entirely free from any defilements or evil ways. But they are associated with them because the Siddha, which is entirely under the power of Avihya, does not itself know the answer to the question, who is Avihya? Avihya and the Siddha are blended together as one, and it is the Siddha which is completely deluded that goes about forming loves and hates which it buries in the elements, Datu, and Kandas. That is, in forms, sounds, smells, tastes, and bodily feeling, and in the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and heart. It also buries love and hate in Rupa, Vedana, Sana, Sankhara, and Vinana, throughout the whole universe, T.I. Lokatatu. It is the things of nature which are seized, and it is love and hate which come from the whole of this deluded heart that grasp and seize them. Because of the power of seizing and grasping, which are the causes, this Avihya heart wanders through birth, old age, sickness, and death. Going round and round in this way through each and every life, regardless of whether it is higher or lower, good or evil, through all the three realms of becoming, Bhava. The different kinds of birth that beings may take in these realms of becoming are countless. Yet the Siddha with Avihya is able to grasp at birth in any of these realms in accordance with the supporting conditions of the Siddha and depending on how weak or strong and good or evil they may be. This heart must then go and be born in those circumstances that present a complete environment to which the heart, with these supporting conditions, is related. 
thus the Siddha gradually changes into ways which are false to its true nature, due only to the power of Avihya. And it begins to stain and color everything in the universe in a false manner, thus altering the natural state. In other words, the original basic elements change and become animals, people, birth, old age, sickness, and death, in accordance with the usual delusion, or avihya, of beings. When one understands clearly with wisdom, that the five kandas and the sabhavadamas are not the main story, nor the ones who started the story, but are only involved in the story because avihya is the one who wields the authority and power, compelling all sabhavadamas to be of this nature. Then wisdom searches for the source of it all, which is the siddha that knows, which is the well out of which all the stories of all things arise endlessly in all situations, and wisdom has no confidence in this knowledge. When mindfulness and wisdom have been developed by training for a long time until they are fully proficient, they will be able to surround and to penetrate straight through to the great center. In other words, the one who knows, i.e. the siddha that knows, who is full of avihya, does not hesitate to fight against wisdom. But when Avihya can no longer stand against the diamond sword, which is unshakable mindfulness and wisdom, it falls away from the Siddha which has been its supreme throne for eons. As soon as Avihya has been destroyed and has dropped away from the Siddha, due to the superior power of Maganana, which is the right weapon for use at this time, the whole of truth which has been suppressed and covered by Avihya for countless ages is then disclosed and revealed as the goods which have been stolen. Or as the entire complete truth. Dhamma which was never before known, then finally appears as Yathabhutananadasana. Knowledge and true insight into all Sabhavadamas which are revealed without the least thing remaining hidden or obscured. When Avihya, the Lord who rules the round of death, has been destroyed by the weapon of Punnanana, Nibbana will be revealed to the one who thus acts truly, knows truly, and sees truly it cannot be otherwise. All the Sabhavadamas, from the five Kandas to the internal and external Ayatanas and up to the whole of the Ti Lokata who are the Dhamma which is revealed as it truly is. There is then, nothing that can arise as an enemy to one's heart in the future except for the vicissitudes of the five Kandas which must be looked after until they reach their natural end. So the whole story is that of Avihya which is just false knowing which goes around molesting and obstructing natural conditions so that they are changed from their true natural state. Just by the cessation of Avihya, the world, Loka, which means the natural state of things everywhere becomes normal and there is nothing left to blame or criticize it. It is as if a famous brigand had been killed by the police, after which the citizens of the town could live happily and need no longer go about watchfully for fear of the brigand. The heart is then possessed of Yathabhutananadasana which means that it knows, sees, and follows the truth of all the Sabhavadamas. And this knowledge is balanced and no longer inclines to one-sided views or opinions. From the day that Avihya is dispersed from the heart, it will be entirely free in its thinking, meditating, knowing and seeing into the Sabhavadamas which are associated with the heart. The eye, ear, nose, etc., and form, sound, smell, etc., then become free in their own natural sphere respectively. Without being oppressed and forced, nor promoted, and encouraged by the heart as usually happens. Because the heart is now in a state of Dhamma and impartiality. For it is impartial towards everything so that it will no longer have any enemies or foes. This means that the Siddha and all Sabhavadamas in the universe, Ti Lokadatu, are mutually in a state of complete peace and calm by virtue of the perfect truth. The work of the Siddha and of insight, Vipassana, into the Namadamas which are associated with the Siddha ends at this point. I want to beg the pardon of all of you who practice for the purpose of getting rid of the defilements using the Dhamma of the Lord Buddha. Who find this exposition different from those that you have been used to? But one should see that the Dhamma in all the old Buddhist texts also points directly at the defilements and the Dhamma which are within oneself. For one must not think that the defilements and Dhamma are hidden elsewhere, external, apart from oneself. One who has Opena Yuka Dhamma, Dhamma which leads inward, firmly in his heart will be able to free himself. Because the Sasana Dhamma, Buddhist Dhamma, teaches those who listen to it to make it Opena Yuka, in other words, 
to bring the Dhamma into oneself. And please do not think that the Dhamma teaching of the Buddha is a thing of the past or future and that it concerns only those who are dead and those who are yet to be born. One should realize that the Lord Buddha did not teach people who were already dead, nor those who were still to be born. He taught people who lived at that time and who were still alive in the same way as all of us are still alive. For it is the nature of Buddhism to exist in the present and to be always a thing of today. May you all be happy without exception, and may blessings come to all of you who read or hear this. Thank you.